Welcome to the Mainly Flies podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Rochester, and today we have a great topic that's really going to be focused on saving you guys some money at the vice. Because we all know, especially now with inflation prices, things have really gone through the roof, and buying fly tying materials can quickly wrap up when you want it in several different sizes and all kinds of different colors. So we're going to go into some ideas or thoughts of how you can save some money at the vice and even stock up on a bit more bulk while in the process. And maybe avoid buying a new material altogether by simply swapping it out for something you already have. We'll get into that discussion in a little bit, but we're going to start off with some channel updates. And after that, we're going to get into your guys' questions. So with 2023 wrapped up, it was a rather big year for me. I had a lot of things going on that kept me busy. On our last podcast, we went into me completing my doctorate and how that was taking up a lot of my time. And part of the reason why we haven't had as many podcasts as I'd like to be able to produce. And of course, I was really hopeful that was changing as soon as I had finished that degree. But then, of course, guide season kicks in and you got the holidays. And just to throw a wrench in the mix, we ended up buying a new house in this period, which it caused me to have to uproot my entire office and move into a new house. And in the guide season, that really made things difficult for me because I I schedule in my guide season, so I have one week on, generally anywhere from three to a week off. That way I can come home, get all the life events done, you know, keep up on the day-to-day stuff, including the fly tying videos and all of that. But when we got the house, every week when I came back, it was a huge process of moving out from the place we already had into the new place while getting some of the, the small tasks done to the house prior to getting everything moved in. Thankfully, there wasn't too many projects that had to be done. It was more or less move-in ready, but there was some things that I wanted to do to my office before bringing all the gear in. Now, I did show my old office in one of the recent videos. I'll see if I can find that and pull it up here. It was a really small space, but I had optimized it to work very efficiently for me, and I didn't realize how important that was until I moved to a new space. It made filming a lot slower, it made tying slower. So anyway, we got a new house and I've been working on the new office space, which I'm really excited about. I finally have a little bit of space and I want to make this one a little more refined than my last one. Now the space does have quite a long ways to go. So this is the new office space. Uh, it's not a giant room, but it's it's a good medium-sized bedroom. It was not a fun space to paint. It has all of these trimming edges that uh, took much longer than I expected. And I ended up going with this darker green color, kind of a, uh, a forest green. This is a nice color. It matches my logo and it reminds me of being in the outdoors doors. So after painting it, I built myself this giant desk out of some countertops that I got from Lowe's. I just bought some desk legs for it, made some pilot holes, and then put it all together. So it's 8 feet by 24 inches for that long piece, and then the one in the the corner is 4 feet by 30 inches to give me a little more working space at the computer itself. And I'm really happy with this desk. I like the look of the, the natural wood as well as its live edges. So And I like having a big desk. In my last setup, I had to have two desks, uh, one for the tying space and one for the editing. And in this office, I really wanted to combine them into one desk. After that, you know, I started thinking about how I could address the acoustics in this room. The first thing I did was caulk all the windows. And then afterwards, I had to think about treating these walls. And I'm still in the process of working on it. But in the back by the desk, I ended up adding in this accent wall, which is a slat wall but behind the slats is actually an acoustical foam. So this is going to help break up sound, make things sound a little bit better. Although we do have a lot more space to treat, at least we got a whole wall where there is some sound dampening and not so much echo that's occurring. The other few things that I did was add some curtains. These are velveted curtains and blackout. So these are also going to help dampen sound. And whatever I'm doing some audio, I can shut these which covers a lot of wall space, preventing some of those echoes. But overall, the really important thing with this office is, well, at least now it's functional. But anyway, yeah, there's a little update on the new office. Really excited to continue to build this out. It's got a long ways to go. And as I continue to do so, I'll give you guys some updates of what I've done and show you, ultimately, one day show you the the final version of it. And with that, let's get into some of your guys' questions. To start off, we have the Half Insane Outdoors guy. And he asks, will you go into colors underwater? Like, how far does light penetrate? 
And why fish might choose to bite a particular color, like a purple bugger, a blue one, that kind of thing. And that's actually a question that comes up quite a bit. So when you're thinking about selecting a fly in darker water, one thing to consider is that the first colors that we're going to lose in darker waters or deep waters is going to be red, orange, and yellow in that order. Red you're going to lose around 5 to 10 meters, orange disappears around, I don't know, 5 to 15 meters or so, and yellow is around 20 meters. After that, the colors that are really going to show through are going to be blacks, greens, and blues. Greens, eventually you're going to lose probably around the 30 to 40 meter mark, somewhere around there. And then you're just left with the blues, purples, and blacks. So that's one way to look at it. If you really want your fly to stand out in dark and dirty waters, you should probably be choosing something like a, a green, chartreuse even, depending on how deep you are. And after that, blues, purples, and blacks. That's going to be your best selection. On a bright day, where all colors are going to show, or if you're just fishing shallow, gin-clear water, that's really completely up to you. If the fish can see all spectrums of light, you know, you might as well just represent what that bait fish looks like. Put some reds in there, yellows, greens, blacks for the back, you know, whatever you want to do. But as that water does become murky, you would be better off selecting some of these darker colors. But another thing to consider is when you're fishing these more turbid waters or darker water condition, is how can you help that fish find your fly uh, that's not based on sight. Instead, you could use things like vibrations or displacing water, little sounds or vibrations that can help that fish key in on, on the bait itself. A good example of this was recently I took a, a trip to Banff and I wanted to do some bull trout fishing while I was there. I only had a couple hours every morning. So anyway, I gave it a try and unfortunately when I got there, it just had been pouring rain, which is great for putting out the fires. But as far as the fishing conditions go, it really made for a difficult task for me. And so I'd spend every morning out there casting in these pretty much pitch black water. Well, not pitch black, but there was so much sediment in it or glacial till that you couldn't really see two feet into the water. So of course, when I was fishing there, I chose some darker colors to help make my fly stand out just a little bit further. I didn't hook into a ton of fish, but I got a few and I had one fly that was actually working better than the other. And oddly enough, it was a light-colored fly. So I went back to where we were staying, met up with my friends who had just, you know, just woken up. And uh, they'd ask me how it went. And I said, uh, pretty slow. I got two hits. And they were both on this lighter fly, which is kind of odd. And then my friend, being kind of a curious type, who, he's not actually a fly fisherman, but he was just like, well, what is it? What is it about that pattern that you think made the fish strike that and not the other one? And me, in my mind, I was just, you know, I was spay fishing. So I kind of cast, walk, cast, walk. So for me, I was thinking, oh, it was just kind of random. I happened to put a cast in the right spot and pass it probably right by its nose. But when he made me think about it, that pattern actually had a rattle incorporated into it, which is going to be really beneficial when it's extremely dark and the fish are having a hard time finding any bait fish. If you can simulate a struggling bait fish or anything like that, you can do this with rattles like this fly had. You could add some rubber legs, a stiffer hackle. Muddler minnows work well for this, or, or any spun deer hair head. Create a lot of different variations in the head of your fly that can create some vibrations. Uh, so yeah, anyway, that was kind of a long rant. But yeah, if you're fishing darker waters, use a darker fly. And then also think about how you can incorporate some sort of vibrations into that pattern to help fish narrow in on it. Uh, the next question is from Moose. And they ask, I'd be interested in hearing if you've ever caught any unusual or unexpected species while fly fishing. I definitely have a few experiences of some odd occurrences. Uh, so this one that comes to mind is I was out fishing on one of my favorite rivers, fishing the one of the largest pools in it for our main landlocked salmon. And it just so happens that I ended up hooking into one. And so as I'm bringing in this fish, which wasn't huge, but wasn't too small, it was probably 17-ish inches. Another much larger fish comes out and just slams into it, T-boning it, trying to take the fish that I just caught. And so what this was, was a much, much larger lake trout that I didn't end up catching either of these fish. The lake trout hit it, pulled it away for a while, and of course my drag is just screaming at this point because it was not set up for a fish of this size. And eventually my hook ended up uh, losing hold, so I lost the salmon and the the lake trout that ended up biting the salmon. <laughs> so I don't know what happened to that salmon, if it lived or if it didn't live, but that was a pretty cool experience. Next question is from Boone. And he asks, what is a good large whip finish tool for to use for larger streamers like muskie and uh, bass and stuff like that? 
that that is a good question. It's not so I don't always tie these larger streamers, and anytime I do, because I don't have a larger whip finish tool, I do have problems. It's a bit of pain to whip finish on a larger fly if you're just not set up for it. What I usually do is use a series of half hitches, you know, put in three, four of them. That's a good enough way to whip finish. Do that, put some head cement, and it's really not going anywhere. Another way I've seen people do it is actually to make their own whip finishing tool. There's a video of it online that you could look up. Uh, let me see if I can just find it. Yeah, so here's one I found. If you can't manage to find one online and you want to make your own, here, this would be a good video to look up. So the channel name is The Frugal Fly Rotter, and it's titled Making a Large Whip Finishing Tool. So if you just put that in Google and you want to start making your own, this would be a, a frugal way to do it. Otherwise, you can buy them. I know that Dr. Slick, which is the maker of the whip finishing tools that I typically use, they make a larger size. They have a four inch, which is, I think, what I typically use, and they also have a six inch size. I don't know if that'll be big enough for you, but that would be an option as well. And the next question is from Vincent Co. Fishing, and he says, I've been wanting to get into fly tying, and my question is, in your opinion, what do you think is a good starter fly to tie? Well, that depends on you. There's a lot of different simple flies that you could tie, but usually when people are getting into fly tying, I like to recommend something that's going to be useful to them right away, because that really sparks an interest is when you, you tie up your own fly, you take it out on the water, and you get to use it and catch a fish with it. But the great thing is, is that simple flies often catch more fish. So a few that I would recommend if you're just starting out, and I, these are already likely flies that you're using anyway, I would start with the pheasant tail nymph, the hare's ear, and woolly bugger, squirmy worms. Those are going to catch fish and they're very, very easy. There was one other. Oh, it's zebra midges. Zebra midges are great. You can tie them in all kinds of different variations. Uh, so depending on your level, you know, woolly buggers are going to be a little more complex than zebra midges. So if you're just, just getting started, get yourself some thread, get yourself some wire, small hooks and a bead, and you can tie up zebra midges in all kinds of different color variations. So if you're looking to fill some boxes up, I would start with that. Tie some zebra midges, egg patterns, worms. Then you can move up to pheasant tails, hare's ears, woolly buggers, and things like that. Other than that, if you have a favorite pattern uh, that you love using, that would be another great place to start, as long as it's not too complex. So anyway, pick one of those, start with that, and then you can build up as you go. You'll pick up a few skills with each of them. If you're truly brand new, you can start off with that zebra midge. That's going to be no problem to tie, and you can move up from there. The hare's ears and the pheasant tails are going to be a bit more complicated, as well as the woolly buggers. But each one of those is going to teach you a few different methods that you'll use for each. So start with one pattern, work your way up, and learn new things as you go. And then just remember to have fun with it and uh, just know that the fish don't care what your flies look like. Only people do. Even if it's terrible in your mind, I guarantee you it's still going to catch you a fish. All right, with that, we have one more remaining question from Cody, and Cody has submitted an audio file, so I'm just going to play that. Hey, Jesse, I have been fly tying for only a year, and your videos have been super helpful, but one thing that could really help me, it's actually more of just like a general ask, is maybe five or even ten, if you have them, tips and tricks about specific aspects of putting material on. So when I say that, um, I'll give you two examples. One example was I was tying a, a streamer pattern and somebody was actually watching me. He's been tying for 30, 40 years and he noticed, he said, hey, one problem you're going to have is you keep bringing your thread all the way back up to the eye of your hook. You need to leave some space there so you can create a really nice smooth head at the end of the fly. That helped me so much. Um, another example was dubbing. I went to actually a fly tying event one time and I kept noted, noticing the people to my left and right, they were barely using any dubbing and they were spinning it on super tight, but they barely put any on. And then it clicked right then and there that, wow, I'm using too much dubbing. That's why it's coming out so large. It's falling off. Um, those little tips and tricks about how to properly lay material and and seed it right and you know loose thread wraps first hard thread wraps all that kind of stuff i've been picking up throughout the days and months i would love to hear like five or ten really good tricks um and if this can help you out if you have any good tips and tricks of how to get your biots to either splay out or just sit on the hook well even with the positioning of your fingers 
that would really help me because I know I'm not the only one that struggles with that. So thanks so much. Appreciate your videos. Thanks for that question, Cody. And you definitely provide a few good tips there of things you picked up along the way. One of them being creating a hard stopping point for the head of your fly. I'll just touch on these because I think they're, they're really good points and a way you can improve your tying pretty quick like Cody did here. One way to not crowd your heads too much is right when you start off and you're laying down a thread base, leave some open space on your hook shank that leads up to your hook eye. And this can be used as a hard stopping point. So when you're tying in, you recognize, all right, my materials cannot go past this point, And that'll leave me enough room to create a really nice clean head. Because a lot of people, and myself included, sometimes I get a little overzealous with how much material I'm putting on working up towards the eye. But a big thing is tying materials all the way up to that hook eye to the point where you actually can't whip finish without covering the hook eye. And it just, it makes this nasty mess. So yeah, if you create yourself a hard stopping point just using your thread or just envisioning this much room needs to be left to whip finish and finish off the head of the fly, then that'll be a great way to improve how your flies look. But it can also improve their durability because you're going to have a better spot to build up ahead. So glad you mentioned that, Cody. That's a great tip. And then, of course, the dubbing. Yes, adding too much dubbing is never going to work. Use a little bit at a time and it's gonna go much further. If you need more, you can always add it on, but adding dubbing little by little is always the way to go. But as far as adding some tips, I wrote down a few things that I thought could help some people out. And of course, we're gonna start off with the biots, which you know I, I understand that struggle, just thinking back to getting started myself. Biots are a little bit of a pain to work with, but there's a few tricks that you can use to really make bi working with biots very simple. So the first thing that I do when I'm working with biots is when I know I'm going to tie them in, so I wrap back towards the back of my fly. And if you want them to splay out properly every single time you do it, one thing I love to do is create a little bit of a thread dam right at the bend of the hook. So just a small bump of thread. And then you'll wrap your thread just in front of it cut some biots free. And so when you're picking them up, there's gonna be one side that's really shiny, that leading edge, it's gonna be smooth, fairly shiny. So you'll take that, lay one biot in your thumb facing upwards uh, with that shiny side facing up, and then you'll grab another biot and place that over the top of it with that shiny side facing down. Now pinch those two together, use a little bit of pressure on your thumbs to even them out so they're, the two tips are parallel with each other, at which point you'll measure it out, get the size you're looking for, and transfer that over to the back of the fly. Now we'll position that just in front of that little bump of thread that we added before tightening it down. So with that done, what we can do is we can wrap back on it slightly, so moving back towards the bend of our hook and over top of this thread dam that we created, and that's gonna help create a bump that's gonna separate these biots, pushing them out in either direction. So they're not gonna stay stuck together, and you're gonna have cleanly separated biots every time. So this is what I like to do. It doesn't take much of a thread dam, and you're really not gonna notice it once you're finished. After that, you just secure them down and you're good to go. Anyway, that's that's my method of securing biots. The next tip I have is pretty similar to that, and it would be used for securing really any type of material, but oftentimes what really comes to mind for this method is securing deer hair or any type of coarse hair, like uh, elk's hair, stuff like that. So in the case where you just wanna create a wing and you want that to be fixed to the top side of your fly, what I like to do it is grab that material in between my index finger and my thumb, hold it in place while I grab my bobbin, bring your thread up, and then pass your thread in a loop just around the material, looping around the material one time before bringing your thread back down underneath the hook shank, using your fingers to help guide the material over the top of the fly, before tightening it down. And so what this is gonna do is that initial loop that you've added in is really gonna help secure that material not only to the top of your fly, but whatever, wherever you direct it. So it's gonna help isolate it and prevent it from spinning around the hook and doing this. And then of course you just tighten it down and you're good to go. So that's a great technique to use for deer hair wings, whether you want it on top of the fly or maybe you're tying in a little bit of a throat. Another very useful uh, spot for this would be elk hair caddis or any type of elk hair wing for stimulators and stuff like that. And there's a lot of different applications for this method, but it's certainly one that uh, I use quite a bit. And I think a lot of people, when they first discover it, that light bulb moment goes off where they're not struggling with tying in the deer hair and it's just kind of going all over the hook and they just end up cutting half of it off because that's what I remember doing before I discovered this. But there's other methods to do it, such as a pinch wrap, and there's some 
the, some times where you might prefer the pinch wrap over the method I just described, but that's a little more technical and we're not gonna get into that. The next tip is locking in materials. So this goes for anything you're tying in and you see me do this all the time. So when you tie in a material to your fly, one thing you wanna continually check yourself is can you wiggle that material around? Because if it has any play in it, this is gonna cause a weakness in your fly and that material is either gonna fall out as you're catching fish or it's gonna to start to spin around your hook. So you really wanna make sure everything's locked in tight. A great way to accomplish that, and you see me use it in many of my videos, particularly when I'm tying in wire, you're, you'll hear me saying, we'll secure the material down, securing both in front as well as behind, and then it's almost intuitive, I have to almost say, and then helicopter the excess free. It's like muscle memory. But the reason I do this, particularly for the wire, is it's creating a pinch. So there's multiple points of pressure that's being applied to this material. When you take thread wraps in our typical direction, just laying over the top, that secures it in one single direction, and the pressure is being applied directly down to the hook shank. When we start adding wraps in front of it, and you're not just adding wraps in front, wrapping forward, you're actually adding your wraps kind of wrapping backwards towards that material. This is creating a little pinch point. So there's two different pressure points. You have the pressure from the thread wraps that you put in front of it, and those are pushing against the thread wraps that we've just done over the top. And this is a great way to lock anything in place. Let's say a leather strip, like a zonker strip, that can be a little bit slippery and tend to spin around the hook. Well, by locking over the top and then pinching it in place with some thread wraps in front of it, that can really help lock it. Same thing for helicoptering free wire. If I don't like to snip my wire. It just hurts my soul. Even if I'm using an old pair of scissors or the back of the scissors, it just it's a it causes me to cringe a little bit every time I snip wire free, even if it's with a, a crappy pair of scissors. So one thing I love to do is just that helps hold the wire in place because if you just secure the wire one way, the when you helicopter free, sometimes it can wiggle through that material. And it's a great uh, technique to implement if you ever find that something is just not locking in properly or when you finish it has a little bit too much play for your liking. But here's a random tip. So you'll, you'll actually see me doing this quite often in videos and one of them is to increase accuracy of your scissor snips or uh, placing of materials. And if you hold your hand out straight, you probably have a little bit of wiggle, some small jitters, and when you're working with such a tiny fly, these little jitters can make a big difference as far as placing things. And this can become a problem as we get older, or for me, this becomes a problem if I have decided to overdo my caffeine intake that day and my hands are kind of going all over the place. Well, an easy way to fix this or just improve the accuracy of your scissor snips, even if you don't wiggle that much, is to, in a sense, almost tripod your hands. So when you're coming in with the scissors, don't do it one-handed. What you'll see me do is putting a finger underneath my scissors, which is allowing for a third point of contact, which takes any sort of micro movements out and it helps me direct those scissors exactly where I want to cut it free. So for me, I find this a great way to snip materials free exactly where I want it. Sometimes I'll use it for placing. So that's a small thing, and I'm sure many of you have just figured that out as you adapt to maybe having a little more jitters or not. But it's a good technique to use to just increase your accuracy at the vise just a little bit more. The next one, and Cody kind of got into this with the dubbing a little bit, but the phrase less is more. It not only goes with dubbing, it goes with just about any material. And a mistake I see often with new fly tires is that they just, they overdo their materials. You know, they're tying in a deer hair wing and they grab this giant clump and they're wondering why the head of their fly is just always so big and kind of ugly. Reason being is you're just, you're tying in too, too much material. It's not necessary for it to have that much. If you have this problem, when you're grabbing materials, cut it in half and use it like that. Because a lot of times, using less really is more. If you use too much of a material, it can cause your fly to bulk up a lot. But it can also make your fly a little more rigid. If you use too much deer hair, too much marabou, it's going to become really rigid. And maybe that's something you want. It might mimic a solid bait fish a little more. But the less you use, the more the water current can catch these fibers, create some wiggle in them, and to me, make a more enticing fly. So if you're going for that dense, bulky look to make a profile, that's a good reason to put in a lot of material. But if you want movement, or if you want your flies to be a little bit sleeker, a little bit cleaner, particularly in head portions, adding a little bit less material is, is going to be the way to go. Just like with the dubbing noodles. Start off with a small amount and just 
add more wraps instead of trying to increase how much dubbing you're putting on there. All right, the next tip that we'll get into is brushing back your material. And this is gonna give your flies a little bit cleaner of a look. So let's just say you've, you've created a dubbing noodle and you're wrapping that forward all the way up to your bead. Now, what a lot of people do is they'll, you know, they, they have as much dubbing as they need, they reach the head of the fly. Typically, you're gonna have a little bit left over on your dubbing noodle. They'll simply tie that off and snip it free. And what this ends up causing is you'll end up catching a few of your materials, like little dubbing hairs and stuff like that, and they'll protrude forward towards the bead itself. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not going to look as clean as if you simply take your fingers before you lock it, brush everything backwards, pull all those fibers that were sticking forward back, and then adding a few thread wraps over the top of them. That's going to give it, as I say, it a nice brush back look. It's going to prevent those fibers from protruding forward and brush them back a little bit. But it's not only going to accomplish these better looks, but it's also adding some durability. Because again, this is creating that little bit of a pinch between these two thread wraps that we talked about a little bit earlier. So it's a good way to clean up the head of your flies. It's going to add some durability. And that also goes for any material. I just use the case of the dubbing noodle because it's probably the one I run into most. But there's plenty of times where you can double over a material to help add some durability. For instance, if you're tying a intruder pattern, I like to not only just tie my wires in, but before I'm finished, I snip them with a little extra length fold those over and then tie them backwards again. And that just locks it in and it's never gonna be able to pull free. And you can do that with materials like foam, deer hair, uh, even marabou, you can tie it forward and fold it back. Normally you don't have to get that extreme about it, but maybe you'll find a useful case where you do. And the last one I'll mention today, we can always do more of these if someone wants to re-ask this question. I mean, there's, there's so many good tips out there. These are just the ones that happen to come to mind right now. And that would be starting with a good base. Uh, this is something that beginners tend to overlook. You'll see it whenever I start my fly. I really like to go through and lay down a good thread base. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. This thread base really does serve a purpose. If you have too many inconsistencies and bumps in your thread base, it's gonna cause materials to jet out in different directions. Just like the thread dam with the biots, if you've accidentally created these thread dams along your thread and it's really inconsistent and bulges here and there, it's going to make it harder to make a material go straight or lay the way you want. You can also use that to your advantage, but it might be a reason that your flies aren't coming out as clean as you'd like if you're not laying a clean thread base. Another reason to add a good thread base is simply friction. It's going to help you hold in these materials a lot better. If you try tying in a material with a clean hook shank, even if you're using proper methods, it's gonna wanna spin around that, that hook shank a lot more. So if you simply add a thread base over it, you're gonna be able to tie things in a lot easier. There you go, Cody. I hope you found at least one of those useful. They're all pretty simple tips that I'm sure many people already knew about, but hopefully a few of them will be able to help some people improve their fly tying. And with that, we're gonna move into the main topics of the day. The first being about material swapping. So taking one material that's called for in a pattern and swapping it out for something else. And then another topic that I'd figure we'd throw in because it's pretty similar to material swapping is how you guys can save some money on your fly tying materials. So we'll start off with a discussion about material swapping. So I get a lot of people that reach out to me asking, can they swap this material for that material? Or what's a good swap for this particular feather because I don't have any. And this is certainly that something that everyone runs into as a fly tire, especially when you're starting out, you're not gonna have everything you could possibly want. One, because it would be extremely expensive to invest in it all at once. But even, even when you have a good collection, you'll come across a pattern that's calling for a specific thing in a specific color, and I don't always have it. But that doesn't mean that you actually have to use that. But one of the cool things about fly tying, and something that I really try to remind people of, is you can make the fly however you like. People view fly recipes as an end-all be-all. So if you look up any sort of recipe that you have to use this, 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 and this, and they'll go out and buy specific materials just for that, even if it's just a different color of material. There's nothing wrong with switching up the colors with what you have. You know, if it calls for a brown biot and all you have is black biots, you know, that's probably not going to matter that much. And if this pattern's working for you, it's probably going to work for you in a different color as well. So if you don't necessarily have the same color marabou, same color biots dubbing, Whatever it might be, you can always swap out the colors with no issues. The only place you might have an issue is the aesthetics of the fly. 
you know, if it was a black fly and all you had for dubbing was orange, you know, maybe it won't look as good to you, but who knows, that hot spot might actually help you catch a few more fish. But the point being is, no matter what the pattern is, you can always swap out colors. But where material swapping gets a little more difficult is when you're trying to take a specific material that you don't necessarily have and swap it out for another. It's really hard to encompass every way you can utilize or swap out a material, but I'll go into a few ideas that you can kind of hopefully take in and think about how you could repurpose materials or swap out a material and use it in a different situation. For example, a deer hair wing. You might not necessarily have the color you want, or you might just not have deer hair at all. But it doesn't mean you can't tie that pattern that calls for it. There's a lot of other things that you could use. Now, the deer hair likely is serving some specific purpose for that pattern. Maybe it's agitating the water. Maybe it's a bit more rigid. And that's what the initial creator was going for. But it doesn't mean that you have to do that to replicate this pattern. I actually love swapping out deer hair for marabou. I think it has a lot more flow. I still tie with deer hair all the time. But a lot of old patterns like black ghosts, Mickey fins all these different things, I really enjoyed swapping them out for marabou. So that's a good example of a material swap. It does change the pattern, so it's not gonna be as rigid as deer hair, but for me, I actually like the, the flow of marabou and how it looks in the water a lot better. So there's certain situations it might work better. Other examples would be the tails. So tails can be easily swapped. You know, let's, let's just say we were talking about biots earlier. There's many different patterns that are going to call for biots because it mimics usually a stonefly tail or something of the sort. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use biots in that pattern. I mean, you could just grab any particular feather, rip off a few fibers, and use that as your tail. There's nothing wrong with that. You could always use pheasant tail or something of the sort. One thing you might run into is biots are very durable. They can split on you, but for the most part, they, they hold up pretty well. If you switch that out for like a pheasant tail, the pheasant tail fibers are probably going to snap on you a lot sooner, but they would have a similar looking profile if you used enough of them. Another case you could swap out biots, and this one is probably a little more accurate as far as if you're trying to stick with the same profile would be rubber legs. Rubber legs, you can tie them in so they splay out just like biots would, you might find it more useful because it's going to have a little bit more movement. Maybe that'll trigger some fish's reaction. So the, the big thing with fly tying is to always, you know, have a creative mind. Try not to be too rigid and focused on those recipes. Just look around your desk and think, what matches close enough or what can I envision filling this gap? Most of the time it's going to work. There are some cases where you do have to be careful and maybe a specific material is either crucial for that pattern or is really hard to replicate with anything else. And we'll, we'll get into a couple of those just to put them in your mind uh, in a little bit. But we'll continue with some ideas on material swapping here for a minute. Another one is dubbing. This one's extremely easy. If a material, if a pattern is calling for a certain type of dubbing, you shouldn't worry about swapping it out at all. You can use whatever dubbing you like the best for whatever reason that might be. It'll give it a slightly different appearance, you know, like a hare's ear is going to be a little bit more uh, buggy than something of just small synthetic fibers that give you a nice tight dubbing noodle. But a lot of times with my dubbing, I like to just play with it, make something that I like. I'll mix synthetics in with some hare's ear. I'll even trim out some of a natural rabbit's mask to give it some more spiky fibers, chop up a, a squirrel tail and just throw that in the dubbing to add some longer ones. There's really a lot you can do with dubbing. Each one's going to have a, a little bit different look to it. One thing you should keep in mind that's coming to my mind is if you're going to be tying a dry fly, you're going to want to use a dubbing that's not going to absorb too much water. So in this case, you don't necessarily have to stick to the dubbing they recommend, but you should have something that's going to float relatively well. It's not going to get too waterlogged. You, usually I won't tie with hairs here for my dry flies. Sometimes I'll add a few of those fibers in, but I won't use um, just straight up hairs here. It's going to absorb a little too much water. Not really what you're looking for in that case. For dry flies, I often use synthetics, incorporating some UV fibers, maybe a few natural fibers, a hairs here, something like that. Uh, but if you want a, a buggier look to your dry flies, one thing I like to do is actually cut up some CDC mix that in with my dubbing, one, because it's going to help it float. Uh, but at the same time, if you brush it out, you can get them to stick out and kind of wiggle around in the water too. So it's it can provide a buggier appearance to your dry fly dubbing. While we're on the subject of CDC, so if you see a pattern that uses CDC, that's a tough one to switch out. You easily can for nymphs and stuff like that. If it has a, let's say, a throat of CDC, 
They're most likely using that for its fine movements, but also the fact that it's helping to trap tiny little bubbles of air. I give it a more lifelike appearance, particularly for emerging insects produce their own little gases to help them rise to the surface. So it could be used in that case. The issue with swapping CDC is, I mean, you could use any little clump of feathers that'll have a similar color and it might look the same, but it's not going to serve that same purpose of being as thin as CDC and trapping some air along with it as well. In a nymph, you can get away with it. Issues where I wouldn't swap CDC is CDC is often used in a lot of very, very tiny dry fly patterns. And CDC is really useful for this purpose. It can allow for a very delicate appearance of tiny flies, and it also floats extremely well. Uh, the problem comes if you want to swap out CDC because it, it can be quite expensive and it's not something that everyone has. It's going to be a little more difficult to swap out in that situation just because how buoyant the CDC is. It's, it's hard to match with other things. One thing that you could swap it out for is foam. It does float extremely well. The only difference is going to be the impact on the water. Uh, so I'll use CDC, for example, like on RS2s when I'm mimicking size 20, 22 blueing olives. You know, really tiny flies that you don't want to have make a big impact on the water. And CDC does this very well, but I guess if you needed to, you could just use a foam-backed fly, and th that'll do a pretty good job as well. But just back to material swappings, you know, any type of wire you have, for example, if I call, if one of my patterns I say to use a, a brassy wire, that doesn't necessarily matter. If you need to swap it out for a different size, really that's not going to be much of a problem. It's going to have a different look if you go too big. But if you use something like a size small or you go up to a medium, it's really going to have a very similar effect, which is probably just to help secure something down or maybe to add a bit of ribbing to the pattern. And you can always swap that out for different colors and stuff like that. Same goes for any type of flash. Let's say they're using a crystal flash and all you have is some thin flashaboo. Well, that'll work just fine. It's just to add some flash to the pattern and you could actually leave it out altogether if you don't want it in there and don't want your pattern to be too bright. Things like uh, chenille would be another good one. You can swap, uh, I often like to swap chenille for a staz to give my patterns a brighter look. And of course that can work vice versa. If you want to tone down a pattern that's maybe a little too flashy, but if it calls for a staz and you don't want it to be that bright, you can just use a a normal chenille, something flat in color, and do it that way instead. There's really just endless amounts of swaps you can do. Another, a big one I like to use is uh, for dry fly wings, instead of using some sort of natural fibers like uh, calf tails to make posts for parachute atoms or uh, wings and wolves, I actually like to use poly yarn in that case because it lasts a little bit longer. It floats extremely well, and really it's just a lot easier to work with. So anytime like I'm tying a wolf or something, unless someone absolutely has to have it the original way. Like if I'm tying them for myself, most likely I'm using some sort of poly yarn. But anyway, yeah, so there's, there's a few ideas to get it in your mind. But the major thing with material swapping is you just have to keep an open mind. Don't get too rigid with following a recipe because in my mind, when I look at a recipe, I just use it as vague instructions for how to make this fly. I mean, you can accomplish a very similar look and pretty much use a different material for every case that they've listed. So yeah, in the end, don't get too rigid with the instructions and just remember to be creative. Look at what you have and try to utilize it instead of uh, running to the store and getting something new. Maybe in some cases that's what you want to do, but don't feel like you need to be obligated to pick up everything for every pattern. You know, a brand new dubbing is almost never something you have to do. A different color is most likely not gonna make that pattern if you gotta swap a white for a tan, you know, so what? It's not gonna matter that much. So just remember to be creative and that kinda gets into uh, the next thing that we're gonna talk about and that's saving money and fly tying. And as long as you're creative, you can go just about anywhere. Like anytime I go walking around a store, I'll see something, even we were looking for furniture the other day. We were at TJ Maxx or something like that. My fiance, she's looking at different colors and you know what would look good on her couch or whatnot. And I'm, I'm just going through these pillows, finding some unique strands and thinking about how I could make that into a fly. Almost the whole time, I'm just there looking for interesting materials that we can, that I could use in my fly patterns. And one of the greatest places to go for this is Hobby Lobby. Now, if you have a creative mind and you walk around Hobby Lobby, you can find so many materials that are gonna be way, way cheaper 
than in any fly shop. And I'm not saying you have to do this every time. If you have the money and you want to go support your fly shop, you definitely should. And there's some things you're going to have to go in for, like hooks and beads. But that's besides the point. If you want to save some money and just honestly have some fun walking through the store and thinking about how you can use different things, places like Hobby Lobbies or different craft stores are an awesome place to look to not only pick up bulk materials, more than you would get in the fly shop, uh, but also at a cheaper price. I mean, if you think about it, fly tying materials are more or less things that were already in existence that we've repackaged, give you less of it, and it's more expensive. The quality of it sometimes is a little bit higher, but we'll walk through a few things in craft stores that you might pick up instead of just shopping at a fly shop. For example, one of the most recent times I went to a Hobby Lobby was because I was out of a particular color of foam, and they come in these giant sheets. If you order them online, you might get two little squares two to three maybe four dollars but at hobby lobby you'll go in and pay a dollar for a 12 inch by 18 inch square so you're getting a ton of material for a cheaper price and it's essentially the same foam that you're buying from these fly tying shops for much more money uh, the next thing would be feathers if you walk around there there's all kinds of different options for feathers this is one thing i will say that the feathers are not going to be the same quality that you'll find in a fly shop of all the things we'll talk about in these shops this is probably the one where you'll see the biggest difference if you were to go into a fly shop the the feathers you find in there are of a much higher quality than anything you'll find in these hobby lobbies part of it is the the quality of the selection or the selected feathers that are in these packages, but it can also be in the dyeing process. But if you do want to save some money, that doesn't make these feathers unusable. They're not going to be as pretty as the ones you might pick up in a fly shop, but they're certainly going to serve a very similar purpose. One of my favorite things to get there are biots. I mean, you can get a bundle of 10 strands for two or three bucks in pretty much any color you want. So it's a great way to stock up on bulk. There's plenty of other feathers there like marabou. There's lots of pheasant tail and plenty of other random feathers. It's actually not a bad place to go look and find something a little bit obscure that you actually might not even find in a fly shop. So feathers are another great one to look for. Another thing you could pick up there is craft fur. There's all kinds of different color variations. The only thing you'll run into is these fibers are usually a little bit smaller, but most of my fly patterns are for trout and salmon. And the fibers that are offered there are generally plenty long enough for a, a size six hook. If you're, if you're tying for bass and stuff, maybe these won't work as well, but it is a very cheap way to get a ton of craft fur. Another big reason to go there is for storage as well as tools. There's all kinds of little storage devices for things like beads, hooks, small materials to help you stay organized because that's one problem with fly tying is we end up collecting so much stuff that sometimes it just ends up in this big black hole and you'll never actually find what you need. And you might do what I do all the time is think I'm out of something, order it, only to find out about a week later that I now have five of that same item. So organization and fly tying is key. And these Hobby Lobbies really have a ton of different storage devices that are made for hobbyists and helping you to organize these small little tools, uh, materials, things like that. Go check out those aisles, see what works for you. The jewelry section is going to have a bunch of stuff for smaller beads and whatnot. And the other storage sections are just going to have larger trays or storage devices that might have tons of little slide outs different size compartments that you can utilize to store different materials. The more options for storage you have in fly tying, the better. It helps you stay organized. It takes a lot of effort to organize it in the first place, but if you can just stay somewhat consistent with putting things back, it can really help you improving your tying speed and minimize how much time you spend digging through all your fly tying materials trying to find something. I certainly realized how much of an issue that was when I moved because I went from knowing where everything was, piling everything in two boxes in order to move them over, and then having to look through these two boxes to find anything. I sometimes would spend 20 minutes just looking for something that I know I have, but I cannot find it. Anyway, to summarize, storage is huge in fly tying and places like the Hobby Lobby are a great place to look for it because it's storage that's made for hobbyists and people who are working with Lots of materials that are often small in size. And on that, there's also a lot of tools there that have some crossover for fly tires. Now, I would not recommend going there to buy your scissors. You should probably go to a fly shop for that. They're going to offer you the best quality scissors, and you really do want a good pair of scissors. The Hobby Lobby, you would think that they'd have some smaller sizes that are very accurate scissors, but every time I look there, they're always much larger stuff, things that are made for like fabrics or cutting foam. Very, very large scissors. 
but I like some pretty darn small scissors with a very fine point so I can get in there and make extremely accurate cuts. So it's not great for scissors, but there's many other tool options there that you could, could make use of, such as there's some wire snips there, and if you're working with foam or anything you want to cut in a straight line, you can buy paper shears, line it up to the size you want, and make very straight cuts of uh, whatever the material might be, like foam, latex, especially because when you're buying at these Hobby Lobbies, everything's gonna come in bulk. When you buy something, the cool thing about it is you just pretty much bought yourself a lifetime supply of it. So instead of at the fly shop where you might only get, I don't know, enough to tie 100 flies, I mean, you're gonna be able to tie thousands of flies oftentimes with how much material you're getting. Other things you could get there if you're into this kind of thing is airbrushes. And as far as other tools go, you'd have to look around. There's there's all kinds of stuff. You see what you might find useful. Let's see other things that are there. I mean, there's all kinds of different materials that you could use as flash for backs of your flies or for tinsel and stuff like that. If you just walk around the store, you'll you'll see all kinds of different examples. And if you're there during the holidays, well, that's probably the best time to find stuff like that. Christmas tinsel works very well for any sort of flash replacement or stuff like that. And another cool thing to check out, and this is often better than fly shops, is going to the jewelry section and looking at the glass beads. There's a ton of color options for these, more than you'd ever find in a fly shop. So if you tie a lot of small nymphs using glass beads, even if you have pretty much every bead that a fly shop offers, taking a trip to one of these stores and looking around, you're gonna find a lot more color variations that you don't have and uh, you actually might enjoy tying with. So definitely check that out. Okay, there's just a few examples of different things you can find in craft stores. There's really endless possibilities in these places. Not only are you gonna be able to pick up fly materials for cheap, but you're also gonna be picking up in bulk and it's pretty much gonna last you a lifetime. So next time you have some free time, go walk around craft store with an open mind and be a little creative and you can find a lot of different material swaps that'll work very well in fly tying. And don't forget that a lot of fly materials really originated from these types of places. People would just pick materials that they thought looked good and they'd use it to make a pattern. So if you go there with a creative mind, you just might find a material that people aren't using That'll be the next great thing in fly tying. And with that, we're going to call this podcast a wrap. So remember, if you have a question that you want featured in the next podcast, make sure to comment it down below. Or as I'd prefer, you can send an audio file to my email and I'll feature you in the next podcast. So thanks for listening, everyone. Good luck fishing in 2024. And as always, I will see you in the next one.